You know, God told us to go into the entire world and preach the gospel everywhere we went. To tell every man, woman, and child the good news about Jesus, that he came and he lived and he died. He rose again to life. And we're called to go all over the world and teach that. And to make disciples and to baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And I would say to you, it would, and we should do all of that, and we are. The Christian church, the churches in America are doing that all over the world. And we should, and we're taking our eye off the ball. If at the same time we do that, we lose sight of those right behind us at home. We've got to do both. We've got to get better at doing both for the generation behind us. Today we're wrapping up a series called Unwavering, where we're trying to build an unwavering faith in the lives of our students and, and to help them change those statistics that we read on the screen, to help them to be in a better spot, spot to go out into the world and, and be a, a follower of Jesus. And the not-so-subtle reality of this series is every one of the anchors we're talking about for our students to put into their heart and soul are all true of us. And so if you want to grow in your relationship with God, this is a, a, a great path for you forward as well. So week one, we talked about having a spiritual family, whether that's your immediate family or just having people around you who love the Lord who are trying to build that into you. You need that. If you don't have that, come to the Life Group Bazaar today and help us, find, help us help you find a family. You need that. Two weeks ago, we looked at the security that comes from personally making an impact. If your faith is all about receiving and not about giving, you're going to miss out on that. You've got to have an opportunity to make an impact with your life. That was week two. Week three was the anchor of identity. To see yourself not based on what you do or what you, other people think, but to see yourself from how God sees you and that God loves you and has chosen you and has a mission for, and plan for you. And today we're going to wrap up the series with the anchor of the gospel. That Jesus lived among us, that he predicted during his life that he would not only be killed, but he would rise again from the dead. And then he did just that. The Jews convicted him, the Romans executed him, and he came back to life three days later. And all are justified freely now by his grace. That is the center of our faith. That is the center of the good news. And anything we do to try to, to differentiate that with something else, we missed it. The center of our faith is not a church. The center of our faith is not a program. The center of our faith is not a building. The center of our faith is not a band or skinny jeans, for heaven's sakes. It's none of those things that we build our churches around. The center of our faith is on Jesus, that he, he lived and he died and he rose again to life just like he said he would. To freely pay our sins and pray for our, our, our wrongdoing. Now we're going to jump into that as we go on this message. I want to get into Romans chapter 15 in a few minutes. So if you want to go ahead and turn to that, it's page 777 in the Bibles there, or, or get your phone out or whatever that works for you. Uh, and you're going to miss it if you're not careful, because I'm going to start into it, and you're not, going to be, you're, you're not going to do it now, and then you're not going to be ready later. So go ahead and turn now so you'll be ready later, and that'll help. I'm really excited that you're here today as we wrap up this series. If I've not met you, would love to do that. I'll be in the, in the courtyard afterwards. I'm Andy. I'm one of the guys here on staff. And uh, let me just let you know what's going on in our church. If this is your first week, I want you to know kind of what you're jumping into. It's a little bit of a, a wave that we're riding right now. Two weeks ago, we had our highest, second highest like regular Sunday, non-Easter holiday type deal service ever. We had 995 people. That was really cool. I'm sure we had five pregnant women over the course of the morning. I almost demanded a recount uh, to stand up for life. Um, but I stayed in my lane. I didn't do that. And so officially, it was 995 people were here. And then last week, so many of you helped us park off site. We had so many cars off site that freed up space in the parking lot. Thank you for much for doing that. The kids, I know, if, even if the adults are a little annoyed by doing that, I know the kids are having a ball riding that bus. So come back and do that again. So last week, we did that and had our highest ever regular Sunday attendance. 1,043 people came to church here last week. Absolutely. Now, at the same time, kind of parallel paths, uh, Drew and Amanda Brown have been here for two weeks. Now, is that a coincidence? I don't know. Maybe that's, maybe that's the whole deal. I don't know. No, I think the center of our faith is on Jesus, not Drew. So that's probably not, that's probably not what I should be saying right now. Uh, we're very excited. So we're riding a bit of a wave. And you know, waves are things only God makes. Only God makes waves. Uh, so when a wave happens, your choice is to either get on top of the wave or get underneath the wave and get rolled underneath it like you do in the ocean sometimes. And so it's much better, a lot more fun to be on top of the wave than it is to be tumbled underneath it. So the best way for us as a church to provide that and to stay up on the wave that God's making, uh, there's two things I really could use your help with until we get this building over here done. Number one is uh, if you could continue to park off site, make that a habit, 
I know that's not, that's not the, necessarily the most convenient off the top, but it's not really that big a deal. And your kids do really do have a ball doing that. If you could do that on a normal Sunday, there's going to be exceptions for you or whatever, but if you could do that on a normal Sunday, that would really help us out. When you do that, you're literally providing a place for someone to come who's coming to find out about God. I mean, it's, it's a clear bit of ministry that you're doing just with your car, uh, so that's great. A second alternative for you that w- would help uh, is in two weeks we're starting our fourth service, our 6 p.m. service. Uh, right here, and so you could come to that, and that would also free up space in the mornings, or you could help with that. If you could say, you know what, I could come back and help on occasion with that, that would also be very helpful to us. Let us know you can help with us in those areas you serve. Both of those are ways to, to create more space to ride this wave that God is creating and not get rolled up underneath it, okay? Also want to let you know, on the September 8th, on that kickoff Sunday, we're going to have kind of a special kickoff celebration for the fourth service, the 6 p.m. service. Uh, Just a fun thing to help kick it off, so I want to invite you to that as well. All right, so today as we're starting off this message, I want to look at a key passage from John chapter 6. In John chapter 6, verse 28, Jesus' close followers asked him the question, what must we do to do the works that God requires? And I love that the disciples were honest enough to ask a question like this. Because this is kind of bottom line. Like, what's, what's the bottom line here, Jesus? I've got a lot of things to do in my life, a lot of demands of my time from work and home and different extra. I've got a lot of things going on. The Bible has a lot of things in it. Help me understand. Get bottom line, what do you want me to do? And if you're a parent, this is especially important for you in your parenting because you're saying, if I'm going to instill one thing in my kid spiritually, what is that going to be? And Jesus answers the question for us. Verse 29, he answered, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. Belief, trust in Jesus, that is the whole of the the works of God. God only asks us to trust Him. All the other things the Bible talks about, and the Bible talks about a lot of things, all those other actions, all those other sacrifices are designed to help us trust Him more. That's why we do it, it's trust. And they say, but what about obedience? Because the Bible talks a lot about obedience. There's even an old hymn, Trust and Obey. Like, how does that work together? What about obedience? Parenting often is about obedience. Well, let's talk about how those two go together. The Bible teaches us that trust naturally leads to obedience. That's a natural consequence of obedience. When we trust God as the leader of our life, we'll obey Him and do the things He calls us to do when we wouldn't otherwise necessarily do those things. We'll do them because we trust Him and He's asked us to do them. Trust naturally leads to obedience. And this is an important part of parenting. We're talking about parenting a lot these days. This is an important part of parenting. You want your kids to obey you in part because you want them to trust you. Like if, if your three-year-old's playing out in the road and you say, hey, buddy, let's get out of the road, you want them to trust you enough to get out of the road not to say, well, now explain to me, Father, why you're asking for me not to play on this nice... Like you just get out the road, kid. Like, you know, I need you to trust me and do what I ask you to do. Trust naturally leads to obedience. Uh, it, it's important we get that. To trust in God comes first, and that naturally then follows with obedience. When we get that messed up, it gets all weird. Because trust without obedience is not really trust at all. If you say, I trust God, but you don't do the things He calls you to do, you don't listen to the things He tells us, then I'm not sure we trust Him at all. James tells us this clearly. James 2 says, so you see, faith by itself isn't enough. Unless it produces good deeds, it's dead and useless. Because trust without obedience is just useless. There's nothing to it. So if we say we trust God, but live our lives in the very same way we would live our lives if we didn't trust Him, I'm not sure it's really faith. Trust without obedience is not really trust at all. But I think there's a worse option. And I think the worst option, worst option is for us to obey God without really trusting Him. Obedience without trust is just shallow and hypocritical. Like if we pretend we trust God because we want to do the things we would do if we trusted Him, uh, we're pretending to trust Him. We're pretending to, to be in relationship. It's, it's fake. It's hypocritical. And if you dr- r- build your kid's faith on that kind of trust, like be a good boy or girl because I don't want you to embarrass me. I want you to do the right things around church people because I don't want them to get the wrong idea about my parenting. Yeah, like if that's the basis of your obedience for your kids, then when they get out underneath your, from underneath your umbrella, that's not going to stick with them. It's got to be tied to a relationship with Jesus. If it doesn't, it's just hypocritical and shallow. Dallas Willard says his history has brought us today to the point where the Christian message is thought to be essentially concerned with only how to deal with sin, with wrongdoing or wrong being and its effect. Our life, our existence is not included now in what is presented at the heart of the Christian message, or it's only included marginally, because the current gospel then becomes a gospel of sin management. 
The gospel is more than just sin management. It's about walking with God through life and trusting Him. And that's going to lead to obedience, but you've got to get the order right. If Christianity is just about sin management and not tied to a vibrant relationship with Jesus, then when your student gets out from underneath your command and obedience goes out the window, their faith goes out with it. It leads to obedience without trust. It's shallow and superficial. There needs to be something more to anchor it. Let me show you maybe a different way uh, this morning through the message. James chapter 4 says, Come close to God and God will come close to you. God's desire for us is not just obedience. God's desire is that we're close, that we trust Him, that we walk with Him and let Him lead us step by step. As we draw closer to God, God will draw closer to us. All of our Christian activity then makes sense in that framework because the reason we pray is to draw close to God. The reason we worship is to draw close to God. The reason we serve is to draw close to God. It's not to impress Him. It's not to do something to honor Him. It's not to do something to, to get His attention or to get His acceptance. He offers that freely. We do those things to draw close to Him. They're all important, but we're not trying to earn something. We're trying to draw close to someone. And our only love, is our only hope is in Jesus' grace. So we're not thinking if we do enough good things, then he'll honor us. No, we, we, we know that we're woefully short. The only thing that's going to help us is the grace of Jesus that he paid for already, and so we just want to cling to him as close as we can. Changes the way we look at everything. Changes the way you look at sin. Changes the way you look at mistakes. Changes the way you look at service. It's all about walking and trusting with God. A friend of mine is a, a pastor of a large church in the Midwest, several thousand people, been there over a decade, huge church, and he's all the time on Facebook posting little cutesy sayings or little quips or little encouragements or whatever, and, um, and, and stuff about the church as well, about faith. He, he does that a lot. And a few months ago, uh, we all found out that he had been having an affair on his wife, and she discovered it, the church discovered it, the leaders of the church discovered it and promptly fired him, but none of that had been addressed yet publicly. Now, his wife stayed with him, and they're trying to work it out. It's been several months and all of that, and we're hoping, hoping that continues and, and those things. But the church has let him go. So the Sunday they were going to announce all of those things, he'd been there over a decade, going to announce all of these things together. The night before, I just imagine what he must have been feeling like, because he knew the next day they're going to announce what I've done. They're going to announce what's happening, what's all of that. And so on Saturday night, the night before, my friend posted on Facebook, never stop being a good person because of a bad person. Now, I didn't read it on Saturday night, but I went back later when I saw what had happened and thought, I read that thought, oh man, my heart hurt for my friend because he knew the next day what was all going to get ready to happen. He was broken, he was hurting, he knew that he had been sinful, and because of his sinful actions, other people now were going to hurt and be broken just like his, his wife was. So with the pastor's heart, he wanted to kind of lay the groundwork for what they were going to hear Never stop being a, a good person because of a bad person. What I grieved about reading it after it happened was so many comments that happened Saturday night by people who didn't know he was talking about himself, and it just kind of hurt your heart for him. Like one person said, well, hopefully there's no need to be a part of a, a bad people in their lives. As Christians, were to set ourselves apart. They thought they were talking about somebody else. Another person said, don't be like him, but love him like Jesus. I'm not even sure what that means exactly, but I thought, wow, that's a, that'd be a hard thing to read exactly. What does that mean exactly? Because see, they thought they were writing about somebody else. They were, thought they were a good person writing to another person about a bad person. But the reality is they were writing to a sinner about a sinner, and they're a sinner. And they had totally missed sight of all of that. And what must that have been like for him to read on Saturday night? And what must have been like for his wife to read on Saturday night? And don't you know that sometimes the way the church responds to sin causes us to want to run and hide? It's always been the temptation with sin is to run and hide. When Adam and Eve sinned, what did they do? They ran and hid because they knew God was coming through. And even though he was the only one who could save them, all their natural instincts said, we better go run and hide. And they did. Their embarrassment, their shame, their judgment fear. It's too much. They ran, they hid. And all these years later, we, their great, 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 great grandkids, want to do the same thing. We want to run and hide. See, there's real confusion today about acceptance. We get all confused today about acceptance. And I don't want to parse too many words here, but I believe this is important for us individually as our, our lives in Christ. I think it's also important for us with our kids. This, this notion of acceptance, this Christian virtue of acceptance, I think we've misunderstood what it is. See, we're called to accept people, even those we disagree with. We're called to accept people, even those who are doing unacceptable things. 
Let me show you. Romans 15, 7 says, Accept one another then, just as Christ accepted you in order to bring praise to God. Christ accepted us after we got our things all fixed out. No, he accepted us right in the middle of our mess. And we're to accept other people right in the middle of their mess. The Bible calls us to many things, but it calls us here, Romans 15, to accept. And I want you to notice the importance of this for parenting. You can accept your kids, your grandkids, even when they're doing unacceptable things. In fact, I would suggest to you that if your son or daughter, your grandson or granddaughter does something unacceptable and is feeling the weight of that, they need your acceptance then more than maybe any other time, right in the middle of their mess. But the word seemed loaded, so I wanted, to, I wanted to look up more. I wanted to know more about it. So I looked it up. It's the Greek word proslambano. And it's translated, of course, except. That's why the Bible writes that. You don't have to know the Greek thing to know the Bible. The Bible is telling you the truth. It's, it's proslambano. It's except. But I wanted to know a little more. I wanted to dig in a little deeper. And this word is a compound word. So the first part is pros, which means towards or interactively with. And lambano, which means to lay a hold of with initiative. So you move towards and lay hold of. It's, it's that combination, okay? So linguist Gary Hill says the definition is to aggressively receive with strong personal interest. Love that. It's not passive. Uh, Dr. Joseph Henry Thayer, the, the, theo- the theologian, says proslambano means to grant access to one's heart. So this is a little deeper feeling than just kind of blanket acceptance. It means to move towards them to grab hold of them, to aggressively receive them, to give them access to your heart. That's not a passive thing. It's an aggressive thing. And I want you to notice one more piece of definition is that you don't see the word approval there anywhere. You can accept people that you don't approve of their actions. If God can't accept us without approving our actions, we're all in deep water, friends. Acceptance and approval aren't the same thing. So you've got to to understand this. But even if you don't approve of someone's actions, you can aggressively receive them. You can move towards them. You can have initiative and give them access to your heart. This is a huge deal for our parenting. I think you get this already. Let me give you a a little quiz to help you. Is a wedding picture, is that a picture of acceptance or approval? For better or worse, for richer or poor, in sickness and in health. Are you picking worse Are you picking sick? Are you picking poorer? No, but you're accepting them even if that's where this leads, right? Better or worse, rich or poor. What about this picture here? No one approves of that. (laughs) Can we, is that acceptance or approval? Can we just, I mean, that happens all the way up the back, right? And how many of you are just throwing that onesie away? Anybody just throwing it? Yeah, just, we'll buy another one. That's fine. Just throwing that away, right? Now, parents, parents, Consider this, if you've ever been a parent, they accept their baby so much that they pre-buy items to clean them up with. And we call the items baby wipes because then its definition is, my kid's going to mess up and I better approve, accept them even though I don't approve of the, of the back business, right? Acceptance, approval are different things. What about this picture here? Is that acceptance or approval? This was the picture, if you don't know the story, that Jesus gave us when he was describing how God feels about you. The prodigal son, while he's still a long ways off, ran to his dad, and his dad saw him and ran to his son. Did he approve of all the money spent on prostitutes? No. Did he approve when his son said, I'd rather you be dead than alive so I could have your money? Did he approve of that? No. But he accepted his son right in the middle of the mess. That hug wasn't about approval, it was about acceptance. And God's love for us is not always about approval, it's about acceptance. God accepts us even when we're dirty. Jesus died for us because he knew we would be dirty, and he wanted to clean us up. And then God calls us in response to accept one another then, just as Christ accepted you in order to bring praise to God. Just as Christ accepted us. That's the model for us. Now, I had you turn to Romans 15 a minute ago. Why don't you turn there again if, you, if you've missed it? Because Romans 15, 7 is kind of the end of a little section. I want you to kind of get the behind the scenes to see how that works together. Okay, so Romans 15, 1 is where we're going to start. Romans 15, 1, Paul says to the Roman church, We who are strong ought to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. So if you're stronger in your faith, you ought to be bearing with the failings of weaker people, people who make mistakes, and this, all of this can apply to parenting if you want to apply it. 
because your children are weaker than you. That's why he gave them to you, right? So you've got so the strong ought to bear with the weak. But he compares that to, contrasts it to, instead just choosing to please ourselves. Now, what does that mean? You can either bear with the failings of the weak, or you can please yourself. That didn't make sense to me until I started kind of meditating on thinking about it. it it's, the, it's the core decision you make. In any relationship, when you get enough mess, and you get close enough to get enough mess, you, you've got a choice. I'm either going to bear with these weaknesses, or I'm going to write you off, which would be pleasing myself. And that's the choice i got to make. Bear with them, write them off. Lift them up, write them off. That's the option often that we make. And it's the option we often have to deal with in our closest relationships, including parenting. Verse 2 says, each of us, all of us, every one of us, should, should please our neighbors for their good. Focus on what they need to build them up. For even Christ did not please himself, but as it's written, the insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. Sometimes it's so easy for me to set a limit of what's too much, and then I compare back to Jesus, who the Bible often does, and says your limit should be like Jesus' limit, who is on the cross getting insult after insult after insult and said, Father, forgive them. They don't know. They don't even know what they're doing. Our limits are all off. And we get confusion with acceptance and approval. We've got to keep at it, just as he chose not to write us off. Verse 4. It says, For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us, so that through the endurance taught in the Scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. So he's saying that one of the real keys for you keeping going is to have hope and encouragement, and you get that from the Bible. Why do you get that from the Bible? Why do you, why do you, get, why do you want to give up? Well, you want to give up because you think it's hopeless. You, you think, I'm, I'm going to reach out to my wife again, and it's not going to work any better than it did last time. I'm going to reach out to my husband again, it's not going to work any better than last time. Or I'm going to keep investing in this child that God has given to me, and it may not be any better. Or this rebellious teen who wants nothing to do with me, I'm going to keep reaching out to him, keep reaching out to him, keep praying for him, keep praying for him, keep praying for him. And you want to give up hope. So how does the Bible give us hope? How does the Bible give us encouragement when we want to give up hope? Because in the Bible, we read about God changing people's lives. So we read about a God who takes a stuttering, weak, insecure Moses and makes him a leader of God's people, leading millions of people because of God's power. We read about God taking a cowardly fisherman, Peter, who betrayed Jesus and went back to the water when Jesus went to the cross, and God turns him into a bold, powerful apostle who reaches millions of people. Or how God took a hate-filled Paul and turns him into an encouraging pastor who wrote all these encouraging letters, including this one to the church in Rome, where 15 says, be encouraged by the way God moves in the scriptures. Let that give you hope, because just like God changes the worst of people here, God will change the worst of people here. If you keep on loving, if you keep on accepting, if you keep on reaching. Even when you don't approve, keep on reaching. Look at verse 5. Verse 5 says, May the God who gives us endurance and encouragement that comes from Him give you the same attitude of mind towards each other that Christ Jesus had, so that with one mind and one voice you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So the encouragement that you need comes from God. The encouragement you need comes, the hope you need comes from God. He is the one who provides it. And He's the same one who gave it to Jesus who was able to go all the way to the cross, forgiving and loving and encouraging those in His life. And ultimately, as we do that, we'll then be able to, verse 7, accept one another just as Christ has accepted us in order to bring praise to God. You need this in your life. You need this in your life. You need this in your relationships. And your kids need that as a foundation for their life. When your kids know that you're going to hold standards and lines and discipline and all of that, I'm not saying, <laughs> I'm not saying let... Let all the rules go. That's not what I'm saying at all. God has all kinds of rules for our benefit. But when they know the foundation is not just the rules, but the foundation is also your love and acceptance of them, even when they're messing up, that gives them a foundation to launch from that they need. They need that. And you need that. And God provides us that in the gospel. Uh, this last week, I've, I've had kind of a weird week. Um, I, I dropped off... Uh, a week ago, I dropped off my second daughter, Emily, at, at Stupid College uh, for the year. 
and did all of that business. And then this last couple of days, we took our oldest, Lauren, back to a different stupid college for a different drop-off, and they went to that. And then on Friday, we celebrated the 13th birthday of my two youngest daughters, so now I've got teenagers and up all the way across, which I think means Amy's getting old, but we're doing all of that. <laughs> and, you know, these, so we celebrated these two on Friday, uh, my two favorite children who have not rejected me and left me for stupid college. So we're, we're, we're doing all of this, and all of these are kind of markers in our life, right? They're all kind of markers, and they're moments, and it, it causes a lot of reflection. And add to that then, I've been to East Tennessee now a couple of times back and forth, so a lot of time in the car, a lot of time to think. And it just gets you thinking about what matters in life. And as I've done that, I've certainly got a lot of regrets. You know, things I, I didn't teach my kids that I should have taught my kids or didn't teach them enough or well. or Times I didn't react the way I should have, those come to mind in, in seasons like this. Times when my priorities got out of whack and they paid a price for that. Um, but as I've thought about it, I've never regretted, none of my regrets... I never have regretted times when I've pushed them to get closer to God. Never once regretted that. I, I've never once re- regretted times that I've, the time I've spent for that, the money that I've invested on all these trips and outings and, and things. I've never once regretted any of that. And I've never regretted from parenting from a place of acceptance. I think your kids need that for our launch pad. And my kids aren't out yet, so I'm still learning this, but I'm ahead of some of you. And I don't think you'll ever regret from, from holding your kids to high standards, but then loving them from a place of acceptance. Living out the gospel through your actions and letting them see the gospel through your eyes. To, to teach them, not just with your words, but with your life, that God's love and His grace are stronger than any of their mistakes. They're going to learn that primarily from you. And you have the opportunity to demonstrate love to your kids, to your grandkids, to your nieces and nephews in ways that that somebody from a distance teaching the Bible or something can never do. You have a better chance to do that than I ever do. And I want you to know that for you. I want you to, to do your best you can to follow every one of the things that God tells us to do. To stop all the things He tells you to stop and to start all the things He tells you to start. I want you to do all those things. But to not do them to earn God's acceptance... To do them to draw closer to Him because He accepts you, He loves you. And to use the gospel then as a launch pad, not only for your kids' life, but for your life. For you to go out and serve and to minister from that place of love and acceptance. I want you to know that God loves you, He accepts you. He doesn't approve of all that you've done, He doesn't approve of all that I've done, certainly. He doesn't approve of all the stuff that we're doing now. Look at the last few days or weeks. He doesn't approve all that either. But I believe God aggressively receives us. I believe God most certainly has granted us access into His heart. And because of Jesus who died on the cross for our sins, right in the middle of our mess, the Bible says, because of that He offers us forgiveness so that we can then draw close to Him. You can't do it without Jesus because you got too much mud on you. But He'll clean you up, and once He's cleaned you up, He's going to hug you. He's going to love you. He's going to draw you close. And as you draw close to him, he's going to draw close to you. But that all starts because of the death and resurrection of Jesus. Not because of your morality or goodness. It starts because of him. And if you've never accepted what he's done for you, there's nothing you can do to earn that. There's nothing you can do to be good enough to deserve that. It all starts because of him. And once you understand that, then you've got to ask him to to be the, the forgiver of your soul to save you. And you've got to ask him to lead you. You know, all the regrets I have are times that I've gotten off of his lead and gone on my own. And I bet that's true for you too, that you go out on your own. And as you do that, then you get regrets. So so part of giving your life to Christ and the gospel is to say, God, I want you to be in charge so I can go your direction now. And in scripture, when people came to this place, they'd be immersed in water, kind of a weird little ceremony. We call it baptism. But they did it as a way to, to pledge themselves publicly to the death and resurrection of Jesus, which saves them and to the death and resurrection of their life, which gives them hope and a freedom. And if you've never given your life to Christ, if you've never asked Him to forgive you, if you've never been baptized to pledge your life to God, I want to give you a foundation, not only for your kids to have an unwavering faith, I want to give you a foundation for you to have a, a launch pad in this life. Free of guilt, free of obligation, all out of the love and acceptance that God offers. We bow our heads and let's pray together.
God, I pray that we'd have a sense of the love that you have when you look at us. Just like the love that we have when we look at these little dirty babies that need cleaned up and wiped up. We've made messes again and again. I think you help us to see that so we can know how you look at us. And you can handle our sin. You can handle our faults. If only we don't run and hide from you. So God, we come out in the open. We acknowledge, God, that you are holy and good and that we are sinful and broken. And we acknowledge, God, that you love us beyond what we can understand. And that you've paid every bit of the price that's required for us to draw close to you. So God, we we draw close to you now. We declare that you are good and that you are God and that you are stronger than any of our sins. And we ask that you'd draw us close to you. That you'd aggressively receive us. That you would open a place in your heart for us to live and dwell. That you'd move towards us as we move towards you. Church, if you've never given your life to God, I'd ask that you'd, you'd offer yourself to Him now, just in your own words. That you'd ask Him to lead your life and forgive your soul. We'd love to take an opportunity to, to celebrate that with you in baptism. Let's talk about that. Take a moment to pray to God. I want to invite you to give yourself to Him today. Pray to Him and then I'll pray for us as well. God, I believe that all of our sin, all of our struggle, all of our weakness is nothing to you. You're able to move it. You're able to forgive it. You're able to wipe it clean. It's a major mess in our life, but it's nothing you can't handle. So God, we don't want it to separate us from you. We don't want to run and hide anymore. We present ourselves to you fully. We give you our our strengths. We give you our sin. We ask for you to forgive us and to heal us, to draw us close. In the name of Jesus, who sets us free.